Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to the Cape Lead Revolution. This is Chachi coming to you again from National Harbor in Maryland here outside the nation's capital here at Washington, D.C. Uh, with a phenomenal guest, the Command Chief of 2nd Air Force, Chief Joe Bass. Chief, thanks awesome. for being on the podcast. Absolutely. Today. Thanks for having me, Chachi. Oh, so this, this is huge. So, so but before we get into this, uh, tell me, tell the listeners, the viewers, a little bit about yourself. All righty. So, Joe Bass, I've been in the Air Force for 26 years. It has been an amazing journey um, and one that's actually a little bit surprising for me even as I sit here today at the National Harbor with you <laughs> and, and, and I think because reality is I signed up to do four years um, never in a million years and I'm sure you can you feel like this too you know never in a million years did you think you'd continue serving in, in our great you know in our great country for so long so anyway um, been serving for 26 years married to an awesome army guy uh, he just retired about two years ago. We have two amazing kiddos, a um, college student who's at Texas State living her best life, and then I have a 13-year-old as well. Um, I happen to be the command chief of 2nd Air Force, and so love my role and responsibility there where we grow and, and build today's airmen. And so from basic training all the way to tech training, that uh, role and responsibility and, and duty falls under us. Um, I've had the privilege throughout my career to work for, with some amazing airmen, um, soldiers, sailors, Marines. I spent half my career in the um, Joint Special Operations Command area, um, working with AFSOC and some um, amazing leaders in that arena. And then I've had, um, a tough 10 years at Ramstein Air Base where, you know, that's a little bit hard living in Germany for 10 years. So 10 years you there, poor <laughs> it was rough. Service and sacrifice. It was rough. You know. um, and, and just, again, had an amazing journey. Spent two years with the Pentagon, spent some time in Texas, and, and, and again now serving um, at the 2nd Air Force um, command level at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. That's awesome. It That's is awesome. awesome. So, so all, all those years ago, you you joined, you know, just like you said, never expected that that you would have gone on to this. Ever. So, what did you come to Air Force to do? So, I had no idea. I came in um, open general. I joined the Air Force from Hawaii. I was actually supposed to go to college. I got a little bit freaked out. Um, and uh, I was a military brat, by the way. My dad was serving in the army in Hawaii. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do in life got cold feet, um, decided not to go to college, and I joined the Air Force. Um, came in open general. All I, all I knew was I wanted to get my GI Bill, and four years would help me figure out what I wanted to do in life. And then um, four years came, and I needed to pay off my Honda Civic. And so that was all the right reasons to keep reenlisting. So, you know, um, you know, reenlisted again. They had an amazing four years. So I joined the Air Force as an aviation resource manager. My first duty station was Hope Air Force Base. Um, no hope, hope, but actually there was a ton of hope um, there. And we, maybe we'll talk about a little bit about hope later that was, on. That was my first duty assignment. It was it really? It was. I didn't know that. Where were yeah. you at? The 14 base houses. Very good. So I was at the 74th Fighter Squadron. You're ready? turned um, 23rd OSS, turned um, 24th Special Tactics Squadron. So again, amazing um, uh, thing, but yeah, I came in open general and lucked up to have one of the best jobs in the world, Aviation Resource Management. That's awesome. Yeah. And so so as, as, as you look back on, on, on your career and all the stuff that you've learned as, as leadership, one, one of the questions I always try to ask in, in these podcasts is, you know, if you could give one piece of advice, and Lord knows there, there's millions, but one piece of advice to any aspiring leader, what would that piece of advice be? I think I would tell folks out there, um, just be you. And, and, and that's what I wish somebody probably would have told me years ago, because I think you struggle in that. You, you, come, you come into the Air Force and you see some amazing leaders and you try to um, assimilate who they are and you compare yourself. And for me as a young female airman, I saw amazing leaders, but they were all primarily male. And, 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 and even my husband, as a matter of fact, you know, I see him as a very strong uh, non-commissioned officer and I, and I saw his boldness and, and who he was. And so I thought that was leadership and it, and it certainly is. 
but it took me many years to learn to be comfortable with who I am and, and the skill sets that I bring to the fight are unique to the team and so to embrace those things. So I would tell everybody to just be you and be the best version of you, meaning you know, hone those skills, um, continue daily to be better than you were yesterday, and, and really that's, that's the key to success, man. 100%. Yes. You know, and so, so along those lines about, about somebody getting to be uh, their, their best them, yes. or, or what I would say, uh, unique or uh, authentic, right? Yeah. Just, so just be authentic in whatever yes. you're talking about. And we're talking about Erin Hatsikostas and, and her podcast. So I'm, I'm now focusing a lot more on, on authenticity because yes. of her. So I'm, I'm really enjoying that. But as far as you being the best you, uh, Dr. Janelle McCauley is, is a colleague mm -hmm. of mine. And, and she goes around the Air Force, talks about that. So she and I have collaborated collaborated in, in the recent weeks and hope to do so again next month. Um, but her, she was the first person to teach me the concept of, of the oxygen mask. Mm -hmm. Is that when you get stressed, you know, if you're in an airplane and you put on the oxygen mask before you help the person next to you, Absolutely. is that we need to do that for ourselves. Absolutely. We need to get right with us before we can help other teams. So, so what does Chief Master Sergeant Joe Bass do to put on her oxygen mask so you can be the best you for the Warriors of Second Air Force? So I am a huge believer in self-care and putting on your oxygen mask and mindfulness, being just taking a minute to just be mindful for where for where you are and, and the amount of, I guess, love and self-care that you give yourself. And that's only because for years and years and years, um, I didn't. For yeah. years and years and years, um, um, I was always that person who's like absolutely, you know, sacrificing uh, myself and or my family so that I could take care of the mission, so that I could take care of my teammates. And, and that's a good thing to do, but sometimes to your own detriment. So self-care for me, um, again, came at a cost. And probably about four years ago, I realized, man, this is just not sustainable. You know, the, the, the prior me thought that, you know, I'll just sleep when I want to sleep, you know, if four hours is good, I'll sleep when I'm in and, and, you know, I'll just keep grinding and grinding hustle is good and, and, and all those kind of buzzwords. Um, and so I never took care of self four years ago. It really hit a critical point where, um, I remember one day my 13 year old, uh, 13 year old now, but I think she was, um, about nine or 10 at the time said, mom, you are always on your computer. And so I would, you know, work 10 hours a day, 11 hours a day, come home, turn my computer on. And although I was home, I was never present. So it made me realize that um, I was really missing the mark on, on being present for my children, being present for my husband, being present for me. So that's when I started getting serious about, man, I've got to take care of myself because I just didn't feel right uh, mentally, emotionally, and, and, and spiritually. And so um, self-care for me is taking care of all of those pillars. I love it because, it, you know, what's interesting is the Air Force teaches you this stuff. So I remember, I mean, don't they? They do. I, I remember being a young airman, and I was probably a senior airman at the time where we learned about the four pillars and I don't think it was called resiliency. You know, we talked we talked about the time. four pillars, and I remember it. You know, kind of being shaped in in a house, and you had spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental, and and um and those pillars have to be strong, or else your foundation is weak. And so, how I take care of my self care is really honing in on all of those things. You know, my spiritual peace needs to be on point. Um, um, and that means something to everybody, you, you know, know, different. For me, it does mean that I go and I serve in church when I'm not traveling and, 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 I, and I do and, um, community service and all those kinds of things. Um, my physical peace means that I have to sacrifice sometimes and wake up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning to get my PT in because when I wait and do it after work, it just never happens. You bet. Um, so the physical piece and and the physical piece also to me means just being healthy it means drinking a ton of water um the food that goes into me um really needs to be good food whole foods and, and i do a lot of study on what it what what is good wholesome food that makes my brain work better um helps me sleep better and then um the social piece and um uh, it is very important the people that you surround yourself with amazing people like you chachi and and you know the other people that you uh, put in your lives you know time is our most precious thing so whom i spend my time with is pretty important so that social piece is is, is serious with me and, and giving time to my family and then of course the, the mental 
uh, piece, you know, how am I mentally growing myself and what am I doing to make myself mentally strong? What am I feeding my brain? Okay. You know, and, and that's going back to D Dr. McCulligan, just the mindfulness piece of that. Absolutely. It's, you know, training our mind for, for battle, for war, for coming back from yeah. war, or just just sustaining the daily grind. Yes. You know, of, of, of life that, that and ends up it ends up being bad. Um, but b backtrack a, a, a little bit. So you and I met. I think it was November of 2015. Yeah. At University of North Carolina. Yes. At their school for business for the Enterprise uh, Leadership Summit or Enterprise Leadership Seminar. Yeah. Is what it was. And so uh, I was not yet a command chief. I had been hired and not sitting at, at my at my my first jobs. I was blown away mm. by the people in that class. Yes. And the content yeah. of, of that class. Um, you know, I, I some some of the, the great takeaways from that weren't necessarily the one guy who would do the, <coughs> the, one, the like he was a real southern gentleman, and if he disagreed, like <coughs> he kind of shake it off to the everything he did the bless your heart kind of thing. Yeah, so yeah. I actually uh, appreciated him, but it, it was very interesting um, the conversations that 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 we were able to have, yeah. and I think a lot since that time is that. I, I've adjusted the way I view somebody's success. Mm -hmm. How I view success now is um, is displayed by the level of conversation you're invited to. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I can only imagine what happens at Second Air Force and the level of conversation for how we can uh, uh, groom, grow, and develop yeah. today's and tomorrow's generation yes. of airmen. Yes. What what is that like? You know how 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 difficult, how challenging, how how rewarding. What what can you share with us about where our air force is going based off the the quality and caliber of people that we're assessing today? So, it is critical that we get it right. You know more today than ever in this global environment in in. in the times that we're serving and more today than ever, I think it matters that, that we in the Air Force get it right when it comes to um, growing today's airmen. Um, every generation has said, hey, air, airmen are different coming in and, and the people who we onboard into the, air, uh, the Army, Air Force, Marines, etc., they're, they're all different. The airmen coming in today are extremely bright, super smart. Um, understand IT way better than somebody like me. They understand um, how to process information and data um, better than before. And let me tell you, their attention spans when it comes to um, just how much they can put in their, their brains is, is just vast. And so we have got to change the way we teach. We've got to change the way um, that um, folks are learning in our classrooms. And we have to evolve because our, our quite frankly, our country's counting on it. Um, so, so the discussions are being had constantly on, on, you know, is the way we're onboarding our airmen correct? Are we bringing them into basic training? Are we indoctrinating them into a service correctly? You know, is basic training where it needs to be? And then is the technical piece where it needs to be? And then, oh, by the way, you know, so, so we have the basic training, which kind of um, shows them how to wear the uniform and then tech training shows them kind of why and what, you know, what uniform they're wearing. Um, we're also looking at character. You know, it really matters that we have people of character in the United States Air Force. Um, and so we are trying to hone in on the goodness of, of the people that are coming into the United States Air Force and just um, expanding that goodness, um, pouring more goodness into them to develop strong character um, traits so that they can um, keep growing our Air Force so that it can be what it needs to be in the next 10, 15, 20 years from now. See, and so, so you know, thinking as, as, as you're sitting in, in this, this leadership, and, and you're charged with helping shape the hearts and minds of our young generation yes, that, that yes. Are, are joining the Air Force. Is this something that you ever saw yourself doing back in the day? Is this something you ever aspired to? Could you have ever imagined this for you in your career? A hundred percent no. <laughs> like, I, again, you know, it, it's crazy for me. I remember being a young senior airman, and, and you made me think about it when you talk about, you know, um, having ability to influence and talk. I remember being a young senior airman um, and I think as a young senior airman, I thought I knew it all. 
and I probably talked like a chief master sergeant, but I only had the world view of a senior airman. Right. And so every assignment that I've had has really grown me and, and provided me more of a world view that has helped me be able to sit in the room and have conversations to help influence, you know, what we're doing in second air force, but never would I imagine it, which is why it's so very humbling um, to, to sit in this position and be able to influence the United States Air Force and how we are growing people. Just, yeah, shocking, humbling, but, but a duty that I take um, very near and dear to my heart. So I know that because of that, I can't halfway do it. I can't half step, you know, I've got to have my A game on. And in order to do that again, it kind of goes back to um, the self-care that we were talking about. You know, I've got to be my best so that I can give my best to you this bet. awesome service. Yeah. You know, and so so w with that, were, were there any times in your career where where you, you either struggled and someone picked you back up or you had a leader and just this awesome seminal moment that said, you know, this is it, that, that kind of put you on your path? Were there impactful leaders, mentors, influencers? and what they did for you and your career to get you to where you are now. like, And that's kind of multiple questions in one. Yeah. Did, did, how did any of that shape up for you yeah. to get you to where you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, so I feel like, you know, if you look at me, I never had like one dominant person, I don't think, or one dominant mentor that has kind of just, you know, impacted my life. I wish I did. And sometimes you hear amazing stories about about that but the reality is I feel like if you looked at me you know um, kind of with that blue light you know that, that they do you would see hundreds of fingerprints on me of people who've kind of shaped the life of Joe Bass and you know starting way back again in, in my um, early special ops days when I had some pretty tough special operators who were my supervisors and you know they, they kind of put their fingerprints on me and showed me um, what it means to serve and, and the bigger meaning of, of service. Yeah. And I probably would never have gotten that from them. And then, you know, I married an amazing Army husband who is, it has a different worldview growing up in the Army life. And so he has shaped me, he, he has all the fingerprints, but he has shaped me and how I think about when it comes to leadership. And then I'll be honest, I've had um, amazing supervisors who've given me a broad sense of worldview. And I've also had some not so great supervisors. Yeah. And you you kind of learn a whole lot from those folks because you learn what not to do. Um, and so I will tell you, I mean, it's I, I can't even pinpoint it to one person. Um, if I did, it would probably again be my husband who's given me a, a amazing um, perspective on what it means to, to lead people, how, you know, you've really got to, um, um, take that hard right when it's easy to take an easy left, you know, I mean, I have it backwards. <laughs> anyway, anyway, in any case, he, he, you know, he's always taught me, you know, you can't short up that leadership, you know, you've got to always do the right thing. You know, and that's like to the, to that point, I've, I've stopped trying to define leadership. Mm. And I think that leadership is the first cousin of love because trying to define leadership is like trying to define love. And the love that I have for my wife is different from my sons, for yeah. my parents, for my brother, for my family, my teammates, my friends, my yeah. pets, all that stuff. You know, and le le leadership is, is, is a mindset. Yeah. It's a position. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's a feeling. It is. It's a feeling that that that, that you can inspire yeah. in, in somebody. And so I, I just I just leadership and love like inextricably linked yes. for how, how we move yes. forward. But how do we convey that kind of love and emotion to, to somebody else with, with with leadership? And you know, ends up well, I, I had a boss who was great, and he says uh, leadership is not difficult, but it is complex. It is complex, kind of like a marriage, <laughs> right? you know. You know, and, and it's it's about those those interactions. Yes. And whether we can get those right. You know what's interesting is you kind of see when it comes to leadership how things go f full circle. I feel like when I came into the Air Force 26 years ago. Um, I don't know that I felt like my leaders loved me, you know? Yep. Now, yep. now, fast forward today, I think it's a little bit different. Yep. I will say, you know, and I don't want to get weird on my airmen, but I'm like, man, I love them. You know, I, I genuinely do. And it, and it's starting to become more acceptable, even as I read a new book um, called Heartfe uh, Heartfelt, Heartfelt Leader. You know, it, it's becoming acceptable 
where you can have a love for the people, your teammates, your, your subordinates, your, your leaders, the team around you, it's okay to love them. And what's funny, and when I say full circle is, you know, if you do research on, um, you know, our, our military and World War One and Two, man, those leaders loved their soldiers. And they were, and it was okay to say, it was okay to write that, you know, for the love of the soldier that you do this. And, you know, and it, when we came up, it wasn't like that, but I think it's starting to come back like that again. You know, I 100% I, I agree. I, I, I have a, a, a picture I build for my basic understanding of, of, of leadership is, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Matrix. I have. You know, and so, so when, when Neo goes back in the Matrix for the first time to meet Morpheus, yeah. he's in that white space. Yes. Isn't a white room just that white space? This is how I envision the birth of leadership. Mm -hmm. Is that if you and I are standing in that blank space and mm -hmm. we don't know each other, yeah, and, and you come up to me and you say, Chachi, I'm here to lead you. And my response to you is, lead me well. <laughs> Where do we go from there? Yeah. You know, like, like from that, because at that point it's like you're you're probably not just gonna task me, yeah. you're gonna learn stuff yeah. about you're you're gonna ask, you're gonna have to care and, and, and do all that stuff but I, I don't think we focus on what I call the person in the blank space mm -hmm. and if we understand that the, uh, the origin of, of, of what yeah. leadership could be I think that can shape so many great conversations yeah. for how we lead grow grow develop people uh, to, to, to get it going in, in, in that sense um, to, twice now you you have have mentioned books uh, do you have a, a favorite book do you have a favorite video uh, a, a favorite podcast some favorite repository for for leadership knowledge that that you go to or any combination thereof i do so if you go to my house right now okay one i'd be embarrassed if anybody went into our bedroom um <laughs> so it's clean but it you know it, like most military houses you're not quite completely settled but but I have books all, you know, my husband has his books on his nightstand and then he has a whole bunch of golf magazines and also cigar books. But anyway, he's retired. Yes, he's, he's retired. And then you look at mine, I literally have like books stacked. And then of course we have libraries. And so I love buying books. Um, and now I've switched to audible versions and things like that. And, and here's the kicker. I didn't always like reading. Me either. So, so for real, I mean, just real talk. And I think we have to be able to share this with, with our audience. You know, I don't always like reading, <laughs> but I get better when I do read. And so, you know, whatever that means to each of you and, and what that means to me is sometimes I just read 10 minutes a day yeah. or maybe it's five minutes, but in that five minutes, you know, I'm zoned in and I've learned a, a thought or a concept or, or something. And that little, um, bit, little bit better yes. than you were the day before. Yes. 100%. So 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 I so I do buy books that that appeal to me and I'll you know kind of scan the um, inner parts of the book and I'll look at you know and and find out what speaks to me and what is something that I want to grow and and be better at and so I'll typically look at the table of contacts and I grab it and sometimes I only read two or three chapters in that book and then I put it away and I keep it or I pass it on to somebody else or but but it's given me something and so there are very few books I've read in its entirety. Um, one book that I think is a United States Airman um, that I love is Old School is Good School. Now that's a book that I got early on, um, written by a retired chief. And, and I hand those out when I go to Airman Leadership classes. And, and I just think it's good because I think there's goodness in old school leadership. So anyway, I've read that in its entirety, but most books, you know, um, it, I, I have a ton of them, too many to list. You guys can go to your bookstore and, and I probably have every single one of those, honestly. But in our busy lives and our busy schedules, you know, yes, I read, um, but I listen to probably two podcasts a day faithfully um, while I'm getting ready. So it's not taking time, you know, out of, out of my day, I'm getting ready. Why wouldn't I listen to something that kind of pours into me? And so again, that's, we talk about the different pillars. So I pour into myself spiritually first and I'll listen to a 15 minute podcast. Um, and then I pour into myself on a professional level after that. So then I'll listen to another one. One of my favorite podcasts is Quick Brain uh, by Jim Quick. So maybe I can like get a free episode while I already get a free episode. So anyway, but I love Jim Quick and I, I share a ton about him. He's on Facebook and everything. But what he, he gives life-size brain hacks for busy people. And so 12 to 18 minutes, he'll have, just like you, he'll have folks on um, 
They'll talk about, you know, how to eat better, how to sleep better, how to memorize things, how to do things, how to make your brain amazing. Nice. And I want my brain, you know, to be amazing. And so I love listening to him. Um, again, yeah, lots of podcasts that I listen to as well. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I want to talk more about that during break. Yes. And uh, we'll be right back with the Command Chief, Second Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant Joe Bass. Welcome back from break. Uh, happy to have you here. Uh, we had a little bit of a chat during uh, during our, our, our quick break, and uh, it's it's just really amazing how how narrow minded I've been through a lot of my career mm -hmm. as far as when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Yeah, yeah. And whether that's going to opposite gender, whether uh, that was different ethnicities, perhaps yes. because because culturally they're going to have you know people are going to have different ideas about how sure. things should happen in different roles and responsibilities and whatever and so so i i i fumbled that greatly through through my through my career and so i think the air force has in the past few years has really uh turned the tide on how we understand diversity and inclusion yeah. but how did that work out for you uh growing up in the military like starting in the mid 90s when we didn't necessarily care about it yeah and just yeah. so in a male dominated military yeah. and or air force how, how did that play out for you yeah so i will tell you um Growing up in the 90s, you just didn't think much of it as a, as a female. You just knew you just had to fit in. You just had to figure it out, try not to make too much noise, um, you know, and even going in, you know, as a young senior airman, as a young E4 into um, a special ops area where I was the first female that was hired into operations, and, and it was probably more of less of a shock and awe for me because, you know, as young women, we learn how to get, you know, just try to figure it out, keep your head low and, and do it. Probably more of a shock and awe for the men in that area because now, you know, they're kind of thinking, man, how do I need to behave myself? You know, do I need to change the way we sure. are and, and, and how is this going to be? Um, but in all of that it was goodness and certainly I wasn't, you know, uh, the first female in the Air Force, you know, and, and others paved the way, but there, there were, at that time was still a lot of firsts. Again, first in operations, first in this and first in doing that. Um, I've never felt in my career though um, that being a female has held me back. And, and I'm probably one, you know, you know, I don't want to say privileged, but I've heard the opposite from a lot of um, other female leaders, you know, so I'm very thankful that I don't, I don't personally feel like it held me back um, because I do believe that most of the organizations that I've been part of, that it was very much merit-based and, you know, you've got to earn your keep. Um, was it more, was it challenging perhaps? Perhaps challenging because where a male might otherwise have a male role model or a mentor that they can reach out to, I don't know that I had a ton of men who who often felt as comfortable reaching out to me as they would um, another young man, and some of them, you know, rightfully so, you know, and, and so so I didn't have like I mentioned before, I didn't have that one mentor. I just gained a lot of great um, great uh, life lessons from from all the various people I had. But I will tell you, so again, not not having. Um, not having any glass ceiling, so to speak, um, being a female, but when people do ask me, hey, well, what was your glass ceiling? Or tell me, you know, what was your biggest challenge? I tell them my biggest challenge was me. You know, again, seeing myself as a leader and learning sure. how to be comfortable in my own shoes, I have been my biggest challenge. Learning, again, to, to kind of um, be comfortable having a seat at the table, learning to uh, be comfortable in my own skin and realizing the, the skill sets that I bring, that's been the biggest challenge. You know, and I, I think kind of all along those lines, I would, I can only hope and pray that the women who worked for me, yeah. even, even, even now, feel, feel the, that exact same way, yeah. right? To where I, I, I wasn't a hindrance. The problem for me is that, and we, we were talking about this, is uh, Jessica Tabor was a, my EO rep when I was command chief in, in, in Kuwait, and we were talking about diversity and, and inclusion. She said, Chief, she goes, you know, Diversity is being invited to the party, yeah. and inclusion is being asked to dance. That is powerful. And he said, you know, how many women have you asked to dance? Like, how many women, women have I uh, set out to groom, grow, develop, mold, yeah. help them evolve personally, professionally, whatever, in, the, in the, their careers? That answer is zero. Yeah, but guess what? 
So we are dancing today. We are. And, we are and, absolutely and that, dancing. No, no, when I love Chachi, that, that you kind of recognize that. I was sitting on a, um, I was sitting at a joint women's leadership symposium in DC a few weeks ago, and we had um, some male senior leaders on a, on a senior leader panel giving their male perspective. Um, one of them was General Mike Holmes, and, and he just really impressed me because I, he didn't say what you just said, but I could sense from his perspective and, and the comments that he made that he realized that perhaps he had missed the mark on, you know, asking, you know, female um, leaders in our Air Force to dance, you know, and he just kind of, you know, took it as status quo, you know, and he, of course, was inclusive. But, but I, I'm sorry, you know, of course, appreciate the diversity, but sure. not necessarily inclusive. And so I think there's a lot of our male counterparts. And so um, we have to just get after that with awareness. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we will continue to grow and expand in diversity and inclusion. I, I absolutely hope so. And again, I, I, I think, again, it's, I think it's for us to, to shape the conversations. Yeah. And it's up for me to tell as many people as I can my story yeah. to where I wasn't bad yeah. per se. I wasn't good. Yeah. You know, and in the words of Benjamin Franklin, if uh, better is possible, good is not enough. Absolutely. And it's opportunities like this where um, people of all kinds, you know, all kinds of um, ethnicities, all kinds of ages, um, different um, genders can, can look at all of us and see the goodness that the diversity brings. You bet. Yeah. And so as, as, as you attend AFA, the Air, Air Force uh, uh, Association, and you, you see all the senior leaders enlisted an officer otherwise you, you 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 see the panels you hear the keynotes you know you, you see the vendors coming out and showing all the stuff that that the technology world is doing yeah. for our airmen and, and, and for for our, our air force how, how does that make you feel you know to know that that you have a distinct part in this for yeah. your role at second air force absolutely so this place is Electrifying. I mean, honestly, yeah. a AFA, uh, I've seen it grow over the last four years, and I love where it's going. I love that our most senior leaders have, have opened the doors to be more inclusive to the enlisted corps. I think that's huge. So 80% of our Air Force um, is enlisted, and, and the enlisted corps of today, again, vastly different than it was years ago. So our airmen are more educated. When you look at the numbers of degrees, you know, uh, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, our airmen have PhDs are coming in into our Air Force even at the age of 39 years old. I just had lunch with a 37 year old um, tech training student who joined our Air Force and that, you know, person spent the last 12 years in law enforcement, came to the United States Air Force with huge skill sets. So, so I love that our Air Force is realizing and valuing the diversity that, um, that the backbone of the Air Force provides and that's our enlisted corps. Um, so it is electrifying to be here and it's exciting and energetic. It's, you know, to hear from our senior leaders directly out of their mouth strategically where we're going in the Air Force, where we need to go, how, how um, we need to grow the airmen that we need for 2030. Um, and then to see our industry partners, you know, partnered with us in this endeavor to create the best United States Air Force for this country is powerful. Um, I love the opportunity. I love to see the junior airmen that we have in here. I love to see the cadets and the ROTC um, kids in here because, again, I have three or four years in the United States Air Force at best. It, it, it's all those younger folks in there who are going to be the ones that are replacing us, and it's important that they start the networking now and they're meeting the connection, you know, they're connecting with the people who will help be part of that change for the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now. So last, last, last question on the podcast, what, what, what can you do, what do you do to, to bridge that communication gap? Yeah. I, like I, I have a, a, a theory, not my theory, someone told me this, is like one of the great things about the Air Force is we have a problem, what I call shit to Snickers. Yeah. You know, an airman can come in and someone's dog had an accident on the carpet. Yeah. He tells the young sergeant, hey, dog dog pooped on the carpet. Yeah. Right? So so he tells the master sergeant, hey, got a carpet issue, can I smell where you cleaned up? Master sergeant tells the squadron chief, hey, May needs some new carpet, not bad, don't worry about it. Squadron chief tells group chief, group chief tells, tells command chief, command chief tells, and so by the time he gets to you, it's somebody found a Snickers bar on the carpet. <laughs> because everyone has applied their requisite level of fix yeah. to, to the problem. They're not trying to make a mountain out yeah. of the molehill. They're, they're trying to do the right thing. But at the end of the day, your finger's not on the pulse of what's happening there at squadron yeah. floor level. 
Yeah. So what 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 can people do? What what can you do? What can other leaders do to try and, and stay in touch with that ground truth yeah. for the people on the front lines? That is a question of the century. Okay. You know, so, so organizations rise and fall on leadership, and they rise and fall on communication. Okay. You know, from from the from from the lowest level to the highest level, laterally, etc. You know, communication is challenging at best. Um, but we have to do our due diligence. And so I think that it's important um, that, that as leaders, we keep our ear to the ground. I think, again, the days are over where we had the chiefs who never came out of their office. And if you, only, if you went to see a chief in the United States Air Force, it was because you are in trouble. And so, so, so those days are gone, you know, as leaders, we've got to get out and about and have eyeball to eyeball leadership. Um, and that means, again, growing our replacements as a, you know, as a chief in the Air Force, I feel like who I need to immediately grow are the senior NCOs who will take my place in the next five years. Um, and I believe that if I take care of those senior NCOs, inspire and develop and grow them, that they're going to take care of the NCOs. And I feel like the NCOs will then take care of the airmen. And so... Um, the communication um, chain is, is key, but we also live in an era where there is a flattened communication chain in, in some respects. You know, if I want to know how airmen feel today, I can get on social media, and, and granted, that, yeah. that's just a certain population, but, but I can, for the most part, get on social media, and I can take my shirt off it and go talk to the folks at the water cooler or, or in the DFAC, the dining facility, and, and, and chat it up with the airmen. I can get some pretty sound um, data. I can make myself available where me and my boss are having lunch or, or breakfast with the airmen, and they can hear directly from our mouths. And so I think in the era that we live in where, where goodness gracious, AFA is live, streaming everywhere we push that out you know leaders at every levels of our organization are able to tap into and hear from that communications there you know we just have to you know constantly um, perpetuate it um, the other key for leaders to me is how do you stay relevant right you know how, how do you stay relevant to um, the generation that we're living in today and so i will tell you you know we have to work hard at that you know again putting diverse teams around us maybe doing some reverse mentoring um that that i i'm a huge fan of you know and that reverse mentoring is you know let me actually pull the airmen in who are walking around second air force and have them come and sit down with me and, and sometimes they get a little nervous and they think they're you know in trouble and i'm like no i actually just want to talk I want to hear your perspective. A hundred percent. Tell me how was your experience at basic training? Tell me how was tech training? If you were king for a day, what would you fix? What are some things that you can do? It is amazing when you just, again, reverse mentoring, grab, grab um, our, our most junior people in, in the company or the most junior people in the Air Force in your organization and ask them, how is life? But the only way they're going to be truthful with you is if you care. You bet. And they can see that genuinely. You have to genuinely care. You have to build a rapport. You, you know, then they will open it up, and man, you're going the floodgates open, and you will get that communication. I can think of no better way to, to end that yes. podcast than, than talking about that. Uh, so, you, I mean, you, you heard it all here. We talked about caring. We talked about alignment, doing the right things. Yes. We talked right here about getting a different perspective, yeah. and then leading expectations and talking to people about expectations. So, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Joe Bass. Thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. Good luck to you and all, all the men awesome. and women in Second Air Force. Awesome, Chachi. It's been a pleasure, and thank you. I lo lo love this beard. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I'm with a PhD or something. But anyway, uh, no, I love it. Um, thank you to everybody who's watching, because I know that if you're watching this, it's because you're trying to be a better you. It's trying to be, you want to be a better human, a better yeah. leader, and so that's all goodness. So thank you. Absolutely. And we'll awesome. catch you here next time on the Cape awesome. Leader Revolution.